My name is Angela. My name is Nicole. And welcome to the Ominous Stitch Podcast. Hello, Stitchers! Hey, everybody! Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Ominous Stitch Podcast. Amazing! Yay! Happy New Year! Happy New Year! I know, we've already done that, but... We already... Know. Yes, we have released a New Year one, but uh, spoiler alert, we did record that before the New Year. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing on your resolution so far? It's been a week! <laughs> How are you doing? I'm okay. <laughs> You're doing okay? Yeah. All right. I'm good. Okay. Good, How good, are you? good. Um, yeah, I think I'm keeping up with some of them, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> did you make resolutions? Yes, I did. And we made a bunch as a family Aww. as well. So it's really cute. So we have a whole list of things that we want to try to do nice. this year. And okay. We're trying not to put pressure on ourselves to be perfect at it, but at least like try achieve okay. and we have goals and so yeah it's nice we call them goals They're i like goals, that yeah instead of resolutions yeah resolutions is a bad word i think yeah inevitably i'll make a resolution and not always, do it yeah. like and then i'll be like man the whole year's shot now yeah and like no that's not sabotage everything true. i yeah. think as long as you make a concerted effort to concerted consorted concerted concerted, concerted. <laughs> words i know see that should be a resolution of mine like use words correctly and pronounce them correctly pronounce <laughs> i'm terrible at that so. oh, well yes everybody knows that we both are not very good at pronouncing words oh, but you all understand what we're saying yeah so. give us give us something that has a bunch of i well this is on my mind because you guys listened to last week's podcast where i had a bunch of native american names that's right and i couldn't pronounce any of them i can't either and i left a bunch of that in because it was cracking me up so much when I was editing, editing it. I was like, okay, this is just ridiculous. How, I love it. How bad I am at Good it. Good job. Yeah. I'm so. proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, my, my not resolution, but I think it's, it's important for everybody is just to be kinder to myself. I think. Yeah. That, that actually is a resolution that we made or at Good. least I made is to be kinder to ourselves yeah. and don't expect so much exactly perfection do what you can but you know you're give not yourself perfect. some grace yes yeah. yeah so that's for everybody yay. yay oh my goodness so what's got you in stitches so what has me in stitches is when you guys are listening to this nicole and i will have finished a 5k at disneyland <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> sorry i'm really loud i'm so excited i'm so excited that's my stitch we're gonna be disneyland and we're going without kids don't tell Ooh, anybody. No kids. Two moms on the prowl at Disneyland <laughs> without children. People are going to look at us like, who are you? <laughs> we are going to be having so much fun. So much fun. <laughs> I can't wait. It's weird. And you know what's funny is I think every hour we're going to be like, oh, I hope our kids are okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> she was quick to that answer. <laughs> you you can feel I, mean, I will. You're so cute because like Nicole will text me. She's like, count down to Disneyland. Woo and then she's like, I feel so good because my sister-in-law took the kids yeah. when she was in town yep. last. And so I don't feel guilty about not taking them. And I'm like, I don't feel guilty about you're like, I'm cool. Them. Yeah. It's this good. is my time. Yeah. I mean, I love going places with my kids. Yes. I love taking them yes. to Disneyland. I love taking them places. But I haven't been to Disneyland as an adult by myself since my my uh, bachelorette party. That's what I did for my bachelorette nice. party. Nice. 15 years ago, whenever that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because this year is going to be, this year, 2024, uh -huh. is, is year 15 for wow. my husband and I. Wow, yeah. that's exciting. So it's been a long time since I've gone to but Disneyland as an adult. Without my kids. Without kids, yeah. Yeah, mine's close. I think mine's about, what, 11 years, yeah. maybe? Yeah. yeah. I was pregnant with him. Oh, well, that's still not that fun, a, though. That <laughs> <laughs> okay, before that, then it would be a lot of rides 11 years. Way, yeah. yeah, it's tougher. Yeah. But it was still fun. Yeah. But yeah. So I mean, it's going to be so exciting. And fun. we're going to run yeah. in the cold. It's oh gonna my so gosh. Cool. It's going to be cold and it's going to maybe rain on us when we're running. Possibly. It'll be an adventure. We'll report back as yes. soon as we're done. But I have not been running, which has been one of my resolutions. Oh, <laughs> no, see, doing. bad. I've not been running. I mean, I have been doing workouts and I've been doing a lot more That's stretching. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, because I used to run a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. 
but I didn't necessarily stretch or do other things to, you know, better keep my, your muscles. Yeah, good. keep my muscles good. That's so important. now I'm focusing more on that than I am good. on the running. Because we're getting old, man. Stretching. Tell me important. about it. Ooh, ooh! I think I found a gray hair. Yay! Oh my gosh! <laughs> I think it could have just been a blonde one, but I don't know. I, I got so excited. I was like, Oh, I think I have a gray hair. Am I taking one away from you? Because I know. No, she, I forgot she about that. I texted She's her. Like, I found a gray hair. I found ah. a silver hair. My first silver white hair and I was like whoa what is this and it's right here I'll have to find it for you but I was like holy cow like yeah I had a like a weird funky part in my hair and then I was like whoa what's that ooh, ooh, ooh. and I got all excited but I didn't tell anybody because I was waiting to tell you but I have no idea where it is I'll have to like find we'll, it we'll again. find it we'll take yeah. a photo <laughs> like, I love it is it blonde is it gray I don't know it's something it's different oh, it's I not it. red all the red is like totally washed out of my hair I'm gonna have to, you do, have to do it again. again yeah I liked the red I, I liked it, it too. Pretty. She should have made it more permanent. Yeah. Well, you know, next time. Okay. It was my first dye job. So, you oh, know, it looked good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now when you get all the grays, you're like, I got to go back to red. Yeah. Go back to red. Yeah. Because that will, the gray will hold the red longer. <gasps> yeah. There you go. Will it? I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Because it's lighter. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're just making rules up. I don't know. Sure. We know about hair. <laughs> oh, so that's my stitch. I can't wait for Disneyland. I love it. It's going to be so fun. You guys, we will do not a live podcast, but no. we will be recording, recording while we're at Disneyland. Woo-hoo. So if you hear us be a little bit tired and our voices be a little bit trash, <laughs> you'll know that we were having deep. <laughs> you know that we will have our, we were having a good time at Disneyland. True so, that. Yeah. Yay. I love it. So Nicole, yes. what's got you in stitches? Hey, guess what? What? I survived driving all the way back or up to Washington and back from Washington by myself. Yeah, that is insane, dude. That I is drove a the long whole way. drive. <laughs> what was hilarious was like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna drive in like two hour increments. We're gonna be good. Yeah. The first forty five minutes going. I have to go to the bathroom. You know who that was from? <laughs> My husband. <laughs> you're like are you like he's like i drink a lot of water what are you doing come on so every 45 minutes going up to washington was a restroom stop it was hilarious um and the ride up was great it was fine we stopped in medford and then we went to uh great wolf lodge because that's where (gasps) yeah my um my brother was really sweet and he's like invited us and my parents so we got to experience it for the first time and it was super fun um, it was like a whirlwind trip though, because we didn't get it until like five, and then we went into the water, and then we had dinner, and then we went to bed, and then we went in the water again in the morning, and we're like, we gotta go, and so I had to like <laughs> pack everything. It was crazy, but it was fun. The kids had a Yay, good time. Hey, good. And um, yeah, so good trip. Driving back, so I understand now why my parents and my in-laws were so worried about us driving in the snow and the passes. Oh yeah, they were making a big deal. Yes, about they were that. like, and "You like, shouldn't drive." Drive in the snow. Yeah, we had chains. We were ready, but it wasn't snowy, thankfully. But it was heavy rain, and I couldn't <gasps> see anything. Oh, it was dark. That's the worst. Yes, it was terrible. So we hit one pass. I don't know if it, we were in Oregon or if we were in California, but we hit this one pass, and uh, there's like huge trucks, and they're going like you know 45, 50 miles an hour, and I was like, okay, I can go past this one because usually I was like just tailing them. I couldn't see anything. Yeah. So I make my way around, and all of a sudden. I don't know if their mud flaps were gone, but this huge like water rush just came <gasps> at my windshield. That's and I, so scary. It Did was you so jump? scary. No, I like braked really hard oh. and I couldn't see for like three seconds and three yeah. seconds driving is a really long time. It's a time. long time. Super you cover long. a lot of ground. Freaked me out. And yeah. I like didn't know if I was curves or not. So I kind of just went really slow for three seconds. I hit my brake. There was a car behind me, but pretty far away. And thank God we got out of it. But I couldn't see. I couldn't Had see. you already watched this week's movie when you were driving? Yeah. <gasps> no, I did it. I, oh, oh okay. we popped it. That's okay. <laughs> we can keep going. But yeah, I did not see the movie. So oh, I'm glad okay. I waited. Good. Because, <laughs> oh my gosh, that would have freaked me out. That would have scared me more. Yes. So yeah, I survived. And my husband was like super proud of me. We stopped in Reading after that whole incident and got dinner. We're like, we just need to eat. It was like eight o'clock at that point. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. got dinner and then we stopped in uh, Chico. And Chico, which yes. I knew was kind of off the grid, but I didn't realize how far off the grid it was. Yeah. <laughs> so another like 45 minutes of just like 
middle of pitch black, like a smaller freeway lane that I yeah. couldn't see and it's raining really hard. Oh. So yeah, that was fun. Not. I am so <laughs> glad that you made it home and you're <laughs> safe and sound. Yeah, I'm not going to do that again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I sort of did that, but I was uh, dri driving west or driving east. Okay. Because, um, you know, you guys know that I grew up in Texas. Yay. Mm -hmm. And I would drive. I drove home my first Christmas as a senior. That was when I had a car when I was a senior at my college at Pepperdine. Woohoo! Woo go Waves. So I drove basically the 10 freeway from Pepperdine. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you know, from the coast. Yeah. You know, from Santa Monica all the way to Houston. Wow. That's where I grew up. So it's oddly enough, it's almost the same distance from there to Houston as it is from here to Crazy. Washington. Crazy. Did you stop? Yes. Okay. I stopped in El Paso, okay, which good. is oddly enough halfway. Weird. <laughs> really? 13 hours to El Paso, 13 hours to Houston. Is that how big Texas is? <laughs> yes. What the heck? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Texas is big. 13 <laughs> hours from one corner to the other. Yep. And that's not even the Dang. whole way. Like Houston isn't even all the way. There's still another like what? I did not know that. Two, four hours to the border from Houston. That's insane. Yeah. To wow. Louisiana. Good yeah. for you. And you're by yourself. Well, no. Oh. So oh, okay. that was a fun story. So I... <laughs> I had a friend who was in the vocal department with me. Um, nice. Shelly. Hey, Shelly. I have no idea where you are, but her name is Shelly. And she was from El Paso. Oh. And so we drove to El Paso together one day. Yeah. And then um, I spent the night at her mom's house. Nice. Woke up in the morning, went to El Paso Airport, picked up Becca. Hey, oh, Becca. Fun. And then drove. Becca and I drove back oh, good. to Houston. So yeah, so you Becca weren't just, alone. I wasn't alone. Phew. I but still, like even with just you know two people driving and yeah. doing that all in one big stretch, it's a lot. That's and a I lot. can't believe you did that. I'll like I know you had people in the car with you, but like. Oh my gosh, I get tired. Yeah, I wasn't. Thankfully, I didn't get tired. I just, uh, you know, I, my, my brain got a little bored here and there. So I had to listen to podcasts and I listened to music. So I had to stop just to like stretch my legs. But yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's a long drive. <sighs> And I like, man, truckers, how do they do that? I don't know. How do they drive I every day? I do it. I think about that when I'm on the road and right? I see the truckers and I'm tired. And I'm yeah. like, how are they doing this? How do they drive for so long? It's crazy. Anyway, um, we got a cool episode because, you know, we have to do this. Um, I think this is going to be like. <laughs> we have to do this? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Okay. Our tradition so far as this is our second year doing this is that in the beginning of the year of last year, and I'll talk about it in when it's story time, but we did reincarnation stories. So Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do. So I think that's going to be our new thing. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. So. I kind of messed it up this week with Why? not doing a reincarnation. Oh. Well, because the first episode of the year wasn't a reincarnation. Meh, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, we'll be give kind yourself grace. Yes. yes. <laughs> I love it. Yay. But Angela's got a really cool stitch. You guys, I love this stitch. I can't believe I've never seen it or I've done never it before. I've never seen it. Yeah. And I came across it and I was like, woo. So I'm totally in love with this stitch Sweet. now. I'm going to be making it a lot. Okay. So should we get stitching? Yeah. Let's get stitching. Okay, Stitchers, so for this week's stitch, we are doing the smock stitch or also known as the honeycomb stitch. Smock. No, yeah, two two names for the stitch. Cute. Smock stitch or honeycomb stitch. So I pulled this off of, well, a couple of different websites. So, but the one that I'm going to tell you guys is about is Rich Textures. Okay. So Rick, Rich, <laughs> Rick, <laughs> Rich texturescrochet.com has a beautiful hat Ooh. that I'm going to be making. So I'm so excited. So maybe one of our patrons might be receiving this hat sometime in the near future. We'll see. Yay! We'll see because I'm yeah, going to be making it. Yeah, she's going to do it. I'm going to do it. Um, and so richtexturescrochet.com and it's called the honeycomb crochet beanie Ooh. honeycomb crochet beanie and the honeycomb pattern 
the, the way that she works it is in the round. So you're constantly working on the right side. Mm -hmm. But there are other patterns. Uh, Nastasia.com is, is the pattern, um, is another place where you can do it, where you're flipping your work back and forth. So there's two different ways to kind of work the honeycomb. If you're flipping back and forth, you can work wrong side, right side, okay. because there is a wrong side and there is a right side to it. But if you're working in the round, obviously you just turn your work mm. as you're working in the round. Which is what I did with my hat. Right. Okay. Right. So Perfect. that's how you get away with the wrong side, right yeah, side Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So basically to achieve this texture, it's, um, you're working with single crochets, but you're working them in different ways. Ooh. Okay. Okay. So, and you're going to work in multiple, well, you need to chain multiples of two because it does take two stitches. I've seen four, but I think any even number will work for this. Okay. Depending upon what you're doing. Um, so anyway, so you're going to chain multiples of two okay. and then, uh, in the, well, plus one, cause then you're going to turn and single crochet your back. way back. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to do another row of single crochet to set yourself up. Got okay. It. Now we're going to start the pattern. Okay. So it's a single crochet followed by a spike stitch. Oh, so you're going to go down to the bottom. That's right. Row. Okay. And then you're going to do a single crochet around that stitch. Mm -hmm. The, right. We, mm -hmm. we covered spike stitch before. So it's like an extended spike stitch. You have to make sure that you pull your yarn up because mm -hmm. that stitch is going to go down two rows and then come back up and complete the single crochet. So you're going to alternate between a regular single crochet and a spike stitch. Got it. So okay. back and forth, back and forth all the way down. Okay. You should end in a spike stitch oh, because okay. if you're doing even numbers, you yes. end in a spike stitch, right? right? Then you chain one turn, single crochet, and then you're going to do this really cool thing. So we end in a spike stitch, right? Single crochet, spike, spike stitch, all the way down, end in a spike stitch, chain one, turn. Got okay. it. Then you're going to single crochet into the first single crochet. And then we're going to do kind of a modified single crochet two together. Oh, okay. But the way it works is that you're going to grab one leg of the spike stitch okay. like that. And then you're going to single crochet two together. So I'm grabbing the last V of the first stitch, the last leg of the first stitch, and the first leg of the next stitch. Got it. And I'm going to single crochet them together. Cool. And then single crochet in the next stitch. So you're still alternating, but you're grabbing the legs of the stitches. Yep, still alternating, but I'm grabbing the legs of the spike stitch. Got so it. the last leg of the first spike stitch and the first leg of the second spike stitch, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're going to single crochet those together and then single crochet into that next stitch. Got it. That's it. Cool. So that's basically it. And then it just makes a honeycomb I pattern. I love it. Right? It's so and textured. So you, it's very textured. And then you go all the way down and then you chain, turn and chain one as you go all the way down. And the thing is when you're doing your spikes on the next row, because the next row will be a spike row, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that when you're doing your spikes, your spikes go into the V. The V, yeah. So it right? picks it up. Mm -hmm. So it picks it up and that's how we make that hon honeycomb that's pattern. That's so cool. So you're always doing your spike two rows down, but yeah. you want to make sure that it goes into, into that, that v, v when you're doing that. Very yeah. cool. So you're alternating between spike stitch rows and between single crochet two together that's so cool yeah, and it makes a really it. neat pattern Yay! and you're making a hat i'm making a hat Good. i'm making a beanie it is thick so it i is. recommend that you use like a really kind of flexible yarn and mm -hmm. not a thick yarn because it does get pretty thick it's bulky it's very bulky. I mean, it's warm, but it's going to be pretty big. Yeah, it's yeah. going to make a really stiff hat. Uh, so that's why I think you want to use kind of a yeah, softer yarn. Got it. So it's not that stiff. It's more flexible. Nice. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. So yay. That is the honeycomb or the smock stitch. I love it. Yeah. Good job finding it. Thank you. Yay. I think it's cool. I'm going to use it a lot. It's very like pretty in texture and lacy. It is. so and, neat. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Kumbaya. So... <laughs> I'm ready for story time. I figured that it is reincarnation yeah, from the movie that we watched. And then I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I have opinions about that movie. It's not movie time yet, but it is story time. So should we get to story time? Of course. Okay. Story time. All 
right. So, hey, again, what's a new year for our podcast without an episode about reincarnation? Reincarnation. I love this subject. Yes. I love it. So I went back. So check out episode 26 (gasps) for the OG episode. That's when it was. 26. Crazy, huh? And we're on 77. Wow. Oh, my God. You guys. You've listened to us 77 times now. You guys need like a pat on the back. You're so awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for being with us. Yeah. So here are some more that I found that are pretty hard to dispute. Okay. Okay. So first one is Sonam Wangdu from Seattle. (gasps) Seattle. Yeah. So if you aren't familiar with Buddhism, know that reincarnation is one of the core principles. And for them, the lamas are highest principles. Sorry, real quick note. So at one point, the term was used for venerated spiritual masters or heads of monasteries. The word lama, right? Yes. Now there are more interchangeable for honorific titles conferred on a monk, nun, or layperson. So... At one point, it was like super, super big for the llama, but now I think there's more flexibility. Okay. Okay. Now, um, the llama, so it's also applied to a lineage of reincarnate llamas. And this is where I start with the first person today. Now, Dejong Rinpoche Kunga Tenpai Nima. Hopefully I got that wow. right. That's a long name. Good job, Nicole. <laughs> like I was talking earlier about not being able to say names. Hopefully I got oh, that right. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, this person was a Tibetan Lama of the Sakyu school. And this is one of four major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. He was the third reincarnated Lama. And when the Chinese government started burning down Tibetan Buddhist monasteries in 1959, Rinpoche fled his home and traveled around the world, teaching and studying throughout India and the United States. In 1960, he was asked to visit the University of Washington in Seattle. But after his visit, he decided to settle down there. He enjoyed the scenery and loved taking walks around his neighborhood with the aid of his assistant. Unfortunately, a bad surgery left his knee pretty messed up, so he needed someone's help. In the 80s, after taking a nice walk around the neighborhood and he you know, stopped to take a break, he leaned over to his assistant and whispered, I will be reborn in Seattle. It is nice and clean and fresh. Aw, how lovely. Yay, Seattle. Yay, Seattle. So soon after, in May of 1987, Rinpoche passed away in Nepal. And here's a photo of him if you want to see oh, it. Oh, Nepal. Yeah, so Yay. he went back. Then, November 1999, uh, sorry, 1991, Sonam Wangdu was born in Seattle, Washington. His father was a Tibetan man named Tenzin Lama. His mother, Carolyn Holly, was born in Indiana and raised Catholic. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. She converted to Buddhism in the 1980s after she divorced her lawyer husband and met tens in there while pregnant in the monastery in seattle she began having visions and believed her unborn child was to be the reincarnation of dead dezung rinpoche the third wow third. yeah at the same time the head lama of the sakya monastery where tenzin and carolyn were studying was also having similar visions Oh, she, the that the, the head of that, that monastery. monastery was having similar visions that she was pregnant with the reincarnation. Correct. Ooh. So they were sharing the same things. Yeah. Now, by the age of two, Sonam knew he was the reincarnate of Dezung Rinpoche. At this point, sadly, his father was killed in a bad car accident. Oh, no. Yeah. But to confirm the reincarnation, Carolyn flew Sonam and herself to India, where Sonam had to undergo a test. Now, according to SeattleMet.com, at a private residence in New Delhi, India, young Sonam was presented with a collection of religious items that belonged to Dezung Rinpoche III. Um, rosary beads, a bell, as well as duplicates that belong to other deceased llamas. And without offering any instruction, um, Rinpoche watched the boy, uh, Dogshen Rinpoche watched the boy to see if he would choose the right artifacts. And he did. Wow. Yeah. Ani Sakya, son of D- uh, Dogshen Rinpoche, head of the Sakya Monastery back in Seattle, was quoted stating, only a person who owns these things would be able to pick them. 
Oh, yay. So you correctly did that. Now, Carolyn recognized that her little son had to move back to Tibet at some point to study the Dharma for 20 years, as he did in his past life. So at just the wee age of four, she packed him up to fly him over. Oh, did she get, she didn't get to stay with him, huh? No. What a crazy sacrifice. Yes, exactly. Wow. I could not do that. No, see, as you can tell. So this stirred up a lot of controversy in America. It was absurd to think a mother could allow her small child to live away from her so long with only visitation twice a year. <gasps> and even then, if she could only gather the $1,200 to fly to her son. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So she knew that was she was facing a lot of hardship for that. She withdrew into her monastery and out of the limelight. And But by the time he left, Sonam answered only to Trulka, Trulkula or reincarnation and eventually became head of a monastery there. I believe he is still there as the article written about him said he was still in Nepal at the age of 23. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think he's in his thirties now. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that Carolyn had a child with her previous husband, Isaac, who lived with his father most of his childhood. He moved to Seattle later in life and he actually visits his half brother quite frequently and they get along really well. So. Oh, that's good. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Yep. Oh, so there they are. That's so cool. I love that. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine the sacrifice the mom made to let her to, son go. But that. she knew. Just the insane faith that that takes. Right. To believe that, yes, my son, this is my son. My, this he is, is his the, destiny. Yes. And that means he needs to go right now. Like, Mm -hmm. can you imagine? No, I cannot because I'd be Uh, super sad. I'm way too attached to my kids. I'm like, when you go to school, you're going to have to go close so you can still live at home. Exactly. (laughs) I need to see you more often. Yeah. Yeah, No, I feel that it's, it's tough, but she made a big sacrifice, but she knew at one point there was in the article, like when he was a little bit older, she flew out to see him and he, um, it was like at a, a place where uh, like, it was like hundreds of thousands of people had gathered to listen to him and meet him. So she knew it was for a greater cause and that's pretty big. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So there uh, you go. Then, and, but like, does he still recognize her as his mom? Uh, like, yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Because she's she still visits all the time. He, you know, when he was a kid, when he did have to travel and do all that, you know, he showed pretty good patience and being like what he has to do. But as a kid, it was a little harder. He had a little bit of impatience. But I well, think yeah, I over time, it's you know, he knew what he had to do. Yeah, which is pretty crazy. So that's insane. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I I couldn't do that. Kudos to her. Right, and that's an amazing faith that she has. Exactly, very strong in that. All right, next is another short one. We have um, an intriguing case about a young boy with a serious knack for golf who was written about by Dr. Jim Tucker in his book, Return to Life. If you recall, everybody, Dr. Jim Tucker, he's like huge in um, reincarnation and he's been doing studies for all his life pretty much. Um, And yeah, so he's got a book, Return to Life. You can check it out. But it features this little (gasps) two-year-old who we will call Hunter no, that's not his real name. He was given a set of plastic clubs and he became obsessed. Then while watching the golf channel, a video clip from the 1930s aired as Hunter watched in fascination. He pointed to golf pro Bobby Jones and announced with such conviction that that was him. And when he was big (gasps) and from then on, he insisted his folks call him Bobby. Bobby. Oh, wow. There's a photo of Bobby Jones. I'm showing her. Yeah. His father was intrigued. He found six photos of 1930s golfers and put them in front of his three-year-old Hunter. And immediately, Hunter pointed at Bobby Jones again and stated, that's me. Then he put photos of several houses in front of Hunter, one that included Bobby's childhood home. As soon as he saw that particular photo, he pointed to it and same home. (gasps) Oh, wow. Yeah. Then when Hunter noticed a photo of Harry Varden, another pro golfer, he stated, this Harry Garden, my friend. Oh, so he got the last name, you know, pretty close, yeah. but that was, yeah, a three year old. Yeah. Wow. Now, at the age of three, still, Hunter was accepted into the five year old class for golf and went on to win 41 out of 51 junior tournaments. What? 21 happened to be in succession. 
Wow, that's amazing. So they were saying like, this is crazy because yeah, he's really good. But at the same time, like how, like that's a little bit too close to be a coincidence. Like yeah. how many he won. And strangers who know everything about golf will comment to Hunter's father that his swing is exactly like that of Bobby Jones. Oh, <laughs> crazy that's cool hunter told his parents that the august uh, the augusta course is his favorite and wouldn't you know bobby jones had founded the augusta national golf club and helped design it <gasps> he didn't know that what yeah but as hunter grew to the age of seven he referenced jones less and less which according to dr tucker is very normal for children to have memories of their past lives fade as they age yeah However, oh, I will go on to some more that kind of contradict that, which is cool. Okay. Yeah, because you contradicted a ton of my theories last year. That's we right. Yeah. Yeah, it was insane. All right. So next, this is a little longer. This is Ryan Hammonds from Oklahoma. Okay. Oklahoma, where the wind <laughs> comes sweeping down the plains. Oklahoma, where the wave and weep. We have a lot of Oklahoma the things. Wind comes oh. right behind the rain. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do I sing that one a lot? I, I every time I mention every Oklahoma. Time. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. In 2004, Ryan Hammonds was born in Oklahoma to parents Cindy and Kevin. He developed his speech late in life due to enlarged adenoids, which are tissue behind the nose and throat to protect the body from viruses and bacteria entering. Yeah, I had my adenoids taken out. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, no. So you know how this is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when it's enlarged, the tissue prevents children from breathing well and even speaking. So at the age of four, his parents decided to have them removed, just like you. Yep. And immediately... Ryan began speaking in complete sentences, but those sentences were odd for a four-year-old as he began to ask about his three adopted sons whom he had given his name to. Oh, what? Four-year-old. <laughs> then he pleaded with his mom, Cindy, to take him to his other family in Hollywood. Yes, he recalled his previous house to be much larger and grander. And at one point he yelled at her, I can't live in these conditions. My last home was much better. <laughs> Four year old, dude. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I love it. I would have smacked my four year old. Like, like, what are you talking about? And the peak of all these strange memories came to Ryan at the age of four, the height of which came at bath time before bed went, but he recounted these memories at daycare as well as home. Cindy decided to check out old Hollywood books from the library to see if she could help Ryan decipher whom he kept referring to when recalling so many memories. And he recognized Rita Hayworth and Marilyn Monroe without any prompts or even seeing them previously. Okay, well, that's pretty amazing for a four-year-old because, True. like, there's no way that they would no, know. No, they would. They I mean, yeah. they might watch something here and there, but I don't know. They wouldn't. It didn't yeah. seem like he had seen anything before. Yeah. But then she brought home a book with a photo from a 1932 movie, Night After Night, and instantly Ryan pointed out an actor whom he claimed to be. But this actor was an extra in the film and was never recognized in the credits. So Cindy did start taking record of the memories Ryan rattled off. And in 2010, she decided to reach out for help at the library. She found a book about reincarnation, mainly on children who possessed memories of their past lives. At the end of the book, there is a note from the author, Dr. Jim Tucker, hey. with an all call to parents who had children that displayed similar memories of past lives. So she calls Doc, uh, or I think she messages him, but she she contacts Jim Tucker at the University of Alabama. He helped in the James Leininger case, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And at around the same time, Tucker was contacted by a producer who was in charge of a new cable TV series, The Unexplained, as he was interested in his reincarnation research. When Tucker told the producer about Ryan, they sent him a camera to film his interview with the boy. Now, after the interview, the film crew immediately moved Ryan's case to their priority in the show because they believed they figured out who Ryan's past life was. They oh. decided to fly Ryan to Los Angeles to see if they could identify locations associated with this past life. Ryan responded to all of them, and they were now convinced that Ryan was the reincarnation of Marty Martin. I watched this. Did you really? Yes. 
I was like, the, as as you were telling the story, I'm like, this is familiar. Sound familiar? This is familiar. Okay. I watched this. Okay. Ooh, I got chills. Yay, I got chills. Good. That's exciting. Well, I cool. So you okay. know this. Now, who was Marty? And there's a photo that they they yes. incorporated. Okay. So Morris Kalinsky was born May 19th, 1903 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His folks had emigrated from U- Ukraine recently. He had two sisters, but one died young. The other sister and Morris moved to New York City where he tap danced on Broadway. And he changed his name there to Marty Kulinski. He then decided to move to L.A. And that's where he changed his name to Marty Martin. He tried acting, as we know, in that 1932 movie, but he wasn't very good at it. So he decided to open his own talent agency, the Marty Martin Agency. Now, this was a huge success and grew a large amount of wealth for him. There are many details that I'm going to dive into on what Ryan Hammonds got correctly about his life. But no, he was married four times, had only one daughter with his fourth wife, fourth wife, and three adopted boys from her as well. Later in life, he was diagnosed with leukemia and died from a cerebral hemorrhage on December 25th, 1964. Oh, no. Yeah. At the age of 61. So let's get into the recorded information Cindy had taken. Now, Tucker concluded that of the 230 statements she recorded from Ryan, 55 were correct. That's 24%. 15 were incorrect or implausible, only 6.5%. And the majority, 140 or 69.5%, were unverifiable. So they couldn't figure out if the other, because they couldn't contact anyone who knew Marty Martin at that point. Right. But most, majority of his, um, the ones that they knew were correct. So here are the few of the statements that were correct about Marty Martin's life from Ryan Hammonds. Yes, the man in the photo that Ryan pointed out was Marty Martin. He did indeed live in Hollywood, and Ryan claimed he lived somewhere with the word rock or mount in the street address. Marty Martin's main residence was Roxbury Drive. Hey. In Beverly Hills. Nice. Yes, he was very rich. And yes, his house was huge. There was a brick wall at the house. He said that there was one. And there were three boys. He knew the boys weren't technically his, but did give his, him his name. He did have a daughter and he did bring coloring books home all the time. His oldest stepdaughter from another marriage did not respect him and they did not get along very well. He got that right. Okay, good. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, not good. But yeah, but he he got that right. Yeah. Yeah. He had a large swimming pool. He hated cats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He recalled being badly scratched by a cat as Marty and in his, you know, as Ryan, he didn't like cats either. So that kind of came through, which was cool or not cool, but you know, interesting. Yes. Um, he bought his daughter a dog when she was six, but she didn't like the dog. (laughs) So no knew that Marty drove a green car that, uh, he would never let anyone else drive. And his wife drove a nice black car. He ran his agency and the agency changed to people's names. He ate in Chinatown a lot. His favorite restaurant was there. He had an African-American maid, had a very uh, extensive sunglass collection. Oh. (laughs) And was a smoker. He knew all this. He knew Rita Hayworth. She made, quote unquote, ice drinks and knew that Mary lady. But you couldn't get close to talk to her. That's quoted from him. Mary lady? Like Marilyn Marilyn Monroe? Monroe. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Nice. He was a staunch Republican who hated FDR. Oh, no. Yes. And he was quoted stating, I'm not five. I'm closer to 105 when I was here before. And sure enough, he would have been 106 years old. Wow. So new exact age. That's crazy. Yeah. And he knew that he died at the age of 61. This was actually very amazing because Martin's death certificate listed his birthday as 1905, which would have put him at 59 year old, years old when he died. However, after much research, Martin's birth year was found to be 1903. So Ryan was absolutely correct. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Yes. Now, with the memories came Marty Martin's behavioral traits that Ryan exhibited a lot more around the age of four, but still carried throughout his life. When recalling memories to Cindy, his tone of voice and mannerisms became more mature. He even told her, I am not the same as the man in the picture on the outside, but on the inside, I am still that man. 
Wow. So this little That's boy crazy. knew, yeah. At night, he would worry about what happened to his children, why he couldn't remember his other m- mother's name, and what happened to his little sister. Oh. Yeah. Then at one point, Ryan watched a cartoon that reminded him of his tap dancing days, which then caused him to start humming show tunes and even started dancing. Ah. <laughs> Four years old. That's fun. He asked his mother to purchase him tap shoes. And when she got them, Ryan started tapping a routine in the middle of the floor saying tip, tap, tip, tap to keep his beat. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Just like, I'm going to tap dance. Yeah. Now. And he's like, he was good at it. Wow. Yeah. That's nice. And be like, cool. I don't I've, have to pay for yeah, I've got, again. <laughs> I've got it. I've got something I can do. He wanted quote unquote agent clothing and loved wearing suits and ties. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he even had a children's pair of 3D specs pop the lens out and continue to wear them everywhere. Aww. Oh, Angela, what were your kids doing at four years old? At four years old? Um, I mean, just being cute and running around and doing four year old things, doing right? Four year old things. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Dressing like rock stars, playing dress up, playing, okay. but like not wearing suits or right? top dancing. Okay. Or- <laughs> So my, my kids were the same. Four years old, they were like playing with toys that were, you know, yeah. appropriate for four-year-olds. Yeah. Well, Ryan wanted to play at making movies. <laughs> <laughs> so at a birthday party, he was, again, four years old, started corralling all the children and began to direct them for his movie. He even <sighs> yelled at the adults for help because it was hard to act and direct a major motion picture all at the same time. Oh, my gosh. It's like, I need to make this movie. Yeah. I, I wonder how many times his parents were like, why did we have his ad yeah. noise taken out? <laughs> <laughs> oh my, that's so crazy. Right. And as I mentioned before about loving Chinese food as Marty, when his folks took him to his first Chinese restaurant, Ryan expertly used his chopsticks without being taught how. Whoa! My kids like don't even know what that is. They were like playing with him. No, this kid, he picked them up and started eating. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. As for the adopted boys, Ryan knew that Marty Martin did not treat them well during his life, and Ryan wanted to make amends for the harsh treatment, but unfortunately, that never came to fruition. Ryan did, however, meet Martin's daughter, who had been eight when he passed and was 57 when Ryan first talked to her. Oh, wow. Yeah. Strangely, Ryan complained when he first met with her that she did not... Oh, she had not not waited for him and that her energy was different, even though he recognized her face. He sadly didn't want to see her again. Ryan. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, she's not a little kid anymore, man. Like she grew up. So sorry. <laughs> like it was weird. Oh, but she was. Bizarre. Yeah, she was really nice and helpful. She confirmed many statements Ryan made about Marty's past life, like the green car, hatred for cats, the dog that was given to her by Marty and his sunglass collection. However, because she was only eight when he passed, she could not help with many of the other statements Ryan made about Martin's life. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, she was young. Ryan made a second trip to L.A., which actually brought a sense of resolution to the Marty Martin life. He was very excited to see all the familiar friends places but he was able to start living in the presence six months after they watched the unexplained episode ryan was featured in cindy walked into ryan's room to see all the decorations related to martin taken down ryan said it was time to be just a regular kid yay oh but martin's personality traits still showed strong in ryan at the age of 11 ryan still loved 1950s music and still wanted to go to new york he dressed sharply loving his button-down shirts and still had a strange fascination with sunglasses he identified as republican and (laughs) followed politics more than an 11 year old boy typically did and even began to show interest in judaism which created tensions in his christian family Oh, because <laughs> Marty Martin was not. Yeah, he was Jewish. Interesting. Yeah. The most baffling trait, though, that Ryan showed was a well-developed psychic sense. Ooh. Yeah. Apparently, other subjects known to be reincarnated would show ESP towards their previous family. However, Ryan had a shine with his own life and family. For instance... He talked to his mother, Cindy, about one of her siblings who had died in infancy, a fact no one brought up around Ryan. Or 
when he wouldn't drop the fact that his father needed to buy a new watch. His mother said no, he already had a watch, but Ryan told her he would need a replacement by Father's Day. Sure enough, the evening of Father's Day, Kevin, his father's watch broke. (laughs) That's cool. Yeah. When he took the first trip to L.A., he predicted correctly that they were going to be given white cars to drive around. And sure enough, white cars. Wow. I mean... that's cool. Yeah. I feel like a lot of rental cars that were white. True. <laughs> yeah. That could be true too. But yes. still, that's cool though. Yeah. Lastly, Ryan had memories of after he passed away as Martin. He recalled an awesome light <gasps> that one should go towards, yet everyone came back in a new body to live again. But before this, when he died, he had to visit a waiting place rather than to heaven. But later, he did recall being in heaven and seeing Cindy from there. He had known her from an earlier life, and he actually chose Cindy to be his mother so that he could take care of her in this life. Oh, that's sweet. See, remember we talked about choosing your families. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's so sweet. So Cindy was chosen, yeah. And Ryan even brought up memories of being in Cindy's womb. Ryan, (laughs) yeah, Ryan asked why she wanted a girl. He He told her, this doctor guy did a test and told you I was a boy. You got mad and said he was wrong. You just knew that I was going to be a girl. Mommy, it was daddy's birthday. You went to a restaurant afterward to eat and you cried for a very long time. (laughs) He was right. Oh, no. Yeah. Cindy felt horrible for this behavior and felt so bad about it. But like I said, Ryan was 100% correct. Oh, my gosh. I would feel so bad. Right? That, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine one of my kids coming up to me and be like, like giving you a memory. Why are you so upset? They are like, what? Yeah, that was my youngest. <gasps> no way. Yeah. Yeah. What? So I swear when I was working at CLU, uh-huh. I swear it was um, a girl. I had uh-huh, a girl. Uh-huh. And the, and um, the admin was like, let's do tests. And they did the ring test and uh-huh, everything. Uh-huh. Girl, 100%. Uh-huh. Went into the doctor. They're like, no, that's a boy. And I was like, no. Oh. <laughs> I didn't cry. I didn't cry. But I was like, I was I was so heartbroken. Oh. But now I'm very happy. I have two boys. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It They're really awesome. Yeah. I like your boys. Yeah. Yes. I kind of knew. Well, okay. My oldest told me and I've said this on the podcast before yeah. she told me every time I was pregnant so she knew mm. obviously she didn't tell me when I was pregnant with her duh duh um but when she, she had she had just turned one she put her head on my tummy and said baby and I was like yep that's where babies come from and then a week or so later I found out I was pregnant with my son spooky and then um same thing when uh before I knew I was pregnant with my youngest mm-hmm. we were sitting on the couch she was three and she goes mommy I have a little brother and a little sister who is far away and I go oh that's nice you know like okay and she's like Yes, she's far away and she's going to have blonde hair and blue eyes just like me. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, okay. And then a week later, I found out I was pregnant again. I was like, dude, she called it again. She's good. And then I kept telling her, I was like, you know, it may be a boy. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. We don't know. She goes, no, mom, it's a girl. And she's going to have blonde hair and blue eyes just like me. That's and she was crazy. very adamant about it the yeah. whole time. She's like, mom, she's going to look like me and it's a girl. And she is dead on. They look so much alike. Yeah. Blonde hair, blue eyed girl. That's insane. Yeah. She knows. That's she crazy. Knew. Yeah. Wow. So Children, she was man. still like way in touch with, yeah. with that. With, with your the body. Other side. Like you said, she had part of your soul. So she probably just knows. She did. She had part of my soul. That's I, so spooky. Well, yeah. It's a, and it's an interesting thing. Has yeah. that happened to any of you guys? <laughs> yeah. Right. Let us know. So when I gave birth to my oldest, I felt a piece of my soul go with her right I didn't feel that with the other two but yeah. with her I definitely felt I was like it was just it's like her. a little bit of a tear Aww. went with her and she is my twin yeah like, <laughs> she is that's so crazy <laughs> she uh, she of course she doesn't like it when I say that because she's very individual she yes. is she's individual she is herself but we are the same height we are the same <laughs> size same hair color same eye color like we are twins yeah and a lot of mannerisms she has the way she acts Mm -hmm. that was me when i was her age so spooky yeah it's twin (laughs) really interesting kid yeah and my youngest is twins with her father 
That's right. You said that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, my son is split right between the mm-hmm. middle of us. Yeah. Takes both so, of you. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. So it's really cool. It. Yay. Well, yeah. Well, there's Ryan Hammond's man. Like, that yeah, blew that's my mind. crazy. Yeah. I saw that. I was like, this is so familiar. And I, I saw that episode. That's so cool. Yeah. So I, that was really cool. Yeah. And I saw they interviewed um, his daughter. Right. And she was like, yeah, he was right about this. Yeah. He was right about this. And they had the whole checklist and they were yeah. going through the whole thing. It was cool. That's so neat. I was like, whoa. Freaky, man. See, how do you dispute that, man? Okay. Let's move on. I've got a very controversial case of reincarnation. Okay. Um, And it happened to an educated Indian woman named Uttar Hudar. Uttar Hudar. Yes. Okay. Oh, Uttara. Sorry, sorry. Uttara. Yeah. So Uttara was born in Nepur Maharshtra. Oh, no, I've said that wrong. Maharshtra. There we go. On March 14th, 1941. And she was the youngest of six six children. While her mother was pregnant with Uttara, she had a recurrent dream of being bitten on the right toe by a snake. But these dreams completely stopped once Uttara was born. When Uttara was a child, she had a severe phobia of snakes that her father described as severe between the ages of five and eight. So there are two main languages in India. Marathi and Bengali, and both descended from Sanskrit. But those who speak Marathi can't really understand Bengali and vice versa. The Hudar family were Marathi speakers and Uttara never had a problem learning Marathi. She tried learning rudimentary Bengali in school, but had no Bengali friends nor family. She was fascinated by the Bengali culture, though, and idolized the Bengali heroes of resistance as her father did. They were fighting the British rule at this point. Mm. One of Utara's brothers did speak Bengali for his job, but he never spoke it with Utara. Now, Utara finished high school and went on to receive her MA in English in 1969, then a second MA in public administration in 1971. These degrees helped her obtain a part-time lecture position by the university's Department of Public Administration. And she was living um, with her family at this point since she was unmarried, which is an, uh, an Indian custom. Right. Okay. She fell for somebody at one point, but it didn't work out because he didn't fall for her. So, Aww. yeah. So in her 20s, she developed a few health issues and began seeing a doctor um, in 1970. But when this particular doctor touched her for the first time, Utada felt an inexplicable spark as, he t- as his touch was familiar and she was drawn to him. Soon, Uttara found a visiting yogi that was conducting meditation sessions, and Uttara participated. Afterwards, at the age of 32, Uttara's behavior began to transform. Hmm. One minute, she would be happy and excitable, the next silent. She began speaking fluent Bengali and even changed her style to that of a Bengali persona. She began treating the doctor as if he were her husband. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, totally different. Her family was concerned and began seeking help from Bengali speakers as they couldn't understand her because she was speaking fluent Bengali out of nowhere. Oh, no. And yeah, they couldn't understand. So with the help of Bengali speakers, her family learned she now identified as Sharada and told them about her life in several Bengali villages, the nearest about 540 miles away from Nagpur. Whenever Utara's personality reemerged, she couldn't recall anything while Sharada was present. And Sharada would come at sporadic times and sometimes for a few days, sometimes for even longer than a month. Whoa. Now, this happened for the remaining time of her life, but after 30 years, Sharada barely occurred once a year. So she still came and went, but just, you know kind of slow down feels like that's more a split personality than it is reincarnation i'm gonna get into that okay 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 i will probably get ahead you're You're getting ahead you're smart you're formulating your (laughs) ideas i know you do that so utara or sharada was interviewed and investigated independently by two researchers indian psychologist vv akulkar and reincarnation research pioneer even ian stevenson who collaborated with satwant parisha and other indian colleagues The two did their own investigations as to not impede on each other's research. Now, during the interviews with Sharada, she gave them her life story of how her ancestors lived in Kestopur, 
gave all details of her family lineage that she was born in Burdwan, Bengal, and how she was raised by her aunt and uncle because her mother had died when she was only two months old. She found a husband with her with his father's disapproval. She suffered two miscarriages and became pregnant for a third time. At five months pregnant, she traveled by cart from Shivapur to Saptagram, where her aunt lived, leaving her husband at home. Within two months of her visit to her aunt while picking flowers, she was bitten on the right toe by a snake. <gasps> oh. She remembered being carried off and then she lost consciousness. Sharada did not remember dying or anything else. The first thing she remembered after losing consciousness in Utara's body was that she came walking in search of her husband. Huh? So after researchers traveled to Saptagram in 1975 to find the genealogy of the names she'd given, they came back to quiz her. They asked for all the names of her male relatives. Unfortunately, females were not recorded back then. Uh. But she gave her great, great grandfather, grandfather, father, brothers and uncles names. And they were all correct. Whoa. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I get the not split personality thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she also gave geographical facts and details about temples and other buildings that were correct and most likely no one would have known except locals. With this information, they calculated Sharada to have been either alive between 1805 to 1829 or 1807 to 1831. What's crazy is that an extensive family member knew um, his great grandmother, a woman of the family, had died of a snake bite. Oh. So this, so it was like corroborated. Yes. Corroborated. Corroborated. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Now people could tell when the transformation of Utara to Sharada were to take place. And it typically, typically occurred every eighth of the waxing or waning moon, supposedly when both she was born and when she suffered the likely fatal snake bite. Mm -hmm. So Utara would become overcome with exhaustion and look pale and lie in bed for a long period of time. Then she would behave as if in a strange house among strangers and soon dress not like her usual Maratha self, but as a Bengali married woman covering her head in a sari and going barefoot outside as early 19th century Bengali women did. Utada's and Sharada's gestures, gates, manners, and personalities would be completely different as well. Sharada was more shy and meek and would only be friendly to Bengali men. She wouldn't even let Utada's father or brother touch her. Sharada was more religious, worshipping Durga instead of Ganesh. She knew extensive Bengali customs and dishes. She also would be adverse to modern technology. She wouldn't touch a light switch and demonstrated ignorance of trains, cars, electricity, gas stoves, telephones, etc. Interesting. Yeah. So she, you know, lived back then. Yeah. Whenever people attempted to talk to Sharada in Marathi, Hindi, and English, all spoken by Utara, Sharatha was unable to understand. And same with Utara, where they tried to slip in Bengali words when speaking in Marathi, but Utara couldn't understand this either. <laughs> that's so weird. So it was like a complete change. Yeah, that's so crazy. Yeah. Now, what's super creepy is that if Sharada was present for longer periods of time, Utara would become incapacitated, unable to speak or even swallow. A few witnesses noticed her tongue and the inside of her mouth became black and her tongue and lips were blue at one point. Sharada then pointed toward her toe, stating a king cobra bit her and a black mark could be visible on her toe. What? What? Like, That's so bizarre. Would change, yeah. Now, I'm sure you can see why Utara's case is so controversial. Some claimed she had DID or dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, right. which you said. However, the argument against this was her linguistic fluency, uh, fluency between Marathi and Bengali. She would have needed years of study to be able to do this, yet she barely knew beginning Bengali. Also, Sharatha had been alive 150 years earlier and over 540 miles away. Most cases of DID's secondary personality is typically living in the same time. There are... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I I mean, like, I I don't think it's split personality anymore because, like, 
Sharatha was a real person. Yes. And they can. They, co- they could corroborate. Yeah, yes. Who she was. <laughs> yeah. There are other arguments for DID, but you're welcome to read about these on the Sci- Encyclopedia website. I just didn't want to put them anymore. I just didn't feel like these, they kept going on. I didn't feel yeah. like there was conviction in those theories. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, the other argument was that it's not a case of reincarnation, but of possession. Oh, U- interesting. Yeah. Utara Sharada did not show the typical reincarnation signs from other cases because of these factors. So Sharada appeared later in life versus others at a very young age. Sharada only appeared once Utara entered her trance-like state. And Sharada's personality completely took over Utara. So like in Ryan Hammond's case, like they were still both of them in there. Like you remember. Yeah, a lot yeah. Of things, he but... was both. He was both Ryan. Yes. And but Marty. this was like a complete different. She was one or the other. Yes. Enough that she couldn't. No. Both couldn't exist at exactly. the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. Right. So I understand the possession thing. Yes. Yeah. However, because Sharada had no knowledge of dying, this was not a common factor in either, in either possession nor reincarnation. Also in possession cases, there is some sort of motivation to possess and the living usually knows the deceased, but Sharada had no idea about Utara until someone told her. However, the similarities of reincarnation stories are of the snake phobia and Utara's extreme fascination with Bengali, Bengali culture. Yeah, yeah interesting that one's cool so isn't that fun though yeah, like that was cool. crazy like so i mean it kind of reminds me of so the possession made me think of that one case where the woman was possessed by the mm. other woman speaking tagalog yes and, yes to get her killer to get her killer yeah. yeah so that reminded me of that case right um but because they couldn't remember she would yeah. like, speak from her and then she'd be like i don't remember talking that way yeah and yeah. she yeah did, did, did was she speaking in tagalog or just with a yes accent okay and she doesn't know to no. yeah so and, but she knew her that was the thing they did know each other yeah. they worked together yeah yeah and there's no way these two women would have known each other because no. 150 <laughs> years apart yes yeah. yeah very different yeah so it's just a different kind of i think reincarnation case yeah that she kind of that the um meditation experience kind of just triggered it i think yeah just unlocked it mm-hmm. wow that's that's really interesting. So isn't it spooky? Like, I like maybe that one. five years later, we'll, we'll like, I'll do something. And I'll be like, well, <laughs> I'm a different person. No. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Okay. Last one I've got for you. Okay. So imagine your little lively three-year-old has a fatal accident and you fear the worst only to see them alive within the next hour. Wait, what? Like, let's say you, like you witness your three-year-old die mm-hmm. and you're like, the doctor comes and's like, yeah, they're dead. Mm. But then... Like an hour later, they're alive and they're uh, fine. What? Uh, but they're different. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. So that actually <laughs> happened, everybody. What? Okay. So this last case is actually a well, a more well-known one. And I, I think I read about this at one point, but I was like, oh, okay. This, this is one I should probably talk about. So Dorothy Eady, she was born 1904 in London, was a spirited little girl who was full of life until, that is, she fell down the stairwell in her family home. The family doctor rushed over and within minutes, he delivered the heart-wrenching news. Dorothy was gone. She was dead. Hmm. But wait, and after an hour later, she had fallen. Her family found Dorothy restless and sitting upright in her bed. Like, what? Nope, she's not dead. That's... So soon, though, they noticed Dorothy was not acting like her normal self. She would ask her parents to be, quote unquote, brought home. She wasn't talking uh, like herself either. She was speaking with a foreign accent. At Sunday school, her teacher was befuddled when Dorothy compared Christianity to heathen ancient Egyptian religion and told her parents not to bring her back. <laughs> yeah. At, yeah. At the Dulwich Girls School, she was expelled for refusal to sing a hymn that called on God to curse the swart Egyptians. <gasps> And the Roman Catholic priest at her church interrogated Dorothy because she mentioned she liked mass as it reminded her of the old religion. Oh, what? yeah. Her parents decided to keep her away from church. At that yeah. Point. Yeah. <laughs> so then her folks bring her to a British museum in 1908. And Dorothy displayed a very abnormal behavior of an English four-year-old girl. As soon as she was taken to the gallery of ancient Egyptian artifacts, she pressed her hands on the glass displays and even knelt to kiss the feet of statues. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. She noticed a photo in the New Kingdom Temple exhibits room and Dorothy shouted out, there is my home. But where are the trees? Where are the gardens? 
This specific temple was of Seti I, the father of Ramesses the Great. Did I say that right? Ramesses? Ramesses? Ramesses. Sure. Then, (laughs) I'm terrible. (laughs) Sorry. Then when Dorothy took... Ramses? Ramses. R-A-M-E-S-E-S. Ramses. Sure. Ramses. Okay. Ramses the Great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then when Dorothy took a seat next to a preserved mummy, her mother tried to pick her up, but Dorothy stated, leave me here. These are my people. Ooh. Yeah. Afterwards, Dorothy would have restless dreams and seemed homesick. She would have breakdowns. Then a few months later, Dorothy was able to see some glossy Polaroids of Egypt, some with hi- hieroglyphs that she claimed to recognize but couldn't understand. But then she came across a photo of Abydos and the Temple of Seti I. Again, she claimed, this is my home. This is where I used to live. Wow. So <laughs> later in life, she moved to her grandmother's home after a bombing raid during World War I, and Dorothy would continue to study ancient Egypt at her public library. Her past life memories continued on as she grew, and at 15 years old, she described a nocturnal visit from the mummy of Pharaoh Seti I. Sadly, due to her sleepwalking and nightmares, she was taken to sanatoriums several times. Oh, no, Dorothy. Yeah. Later, Dorothy attended the Plymouth Art School part-time, all the while collecting affordable Egyptian antiquities. Then, when she was 27, she worked in London with an Egyptian public relations magazine. Here, she wrote articles and drew cartoons that reflected her political support for an independent Egypt. She started dating her future husband, Imam Abdel Megweed, an Egyptian student, and moved to Egypt in 1931 when she asked him to marry her. Now, straight from (laughs) Wikipedia, let me give you this. During her early period, Edie reported nighttime visitations by an entity called Hor Ra, who she claimed was the spirit of Seti One. Edie stated that Hor Ra slowly dictated to her over a 12-month period the story of her previous life. The story written by Edie took up about 70 pages of cursive hieroglyphic text. (laughs) It described the life of a young woman in ancient Egypt called Ben Treshit, who had reincarnated in the person of Dorothy Edie. Ben Treshit, meaning harp of joy, is described in this text as being of humble origin, her mother a vegetable seller and her father a soldier during the reign of Seti I, 1290 BC to 1279 BC. Dude, that was so long ago. (laughs) Super long. (laughs) When she was three, her mother died and she was placed in the temple of (gasps) Qom el Sut. Sultan because her father could not afford her. There she was brought up to be a priestess. When she was 12 years old, the high priest asked her if she wished to go out into the world or stay and become a consecrated virgin. In the absence of full understanding and without a practical alternative, she took the vows. During the next two years, she learned her role in the annual drama of Osiris's Passion and Resurrection, a role that only virgin priestesses consecrated to Isis could perform. One day, Seti I visited and spoke to her. They became lovers eating the uncooked goose, an ancient Egyptian term that had been compared to eating the forbidden fruit. (laughs) You know what that means. Uh Uh-huh. It's not virgin anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. When Ben Treshit became pregnant, she told the high priest who the father was. The high priest informed her that the gravity of the offense against Isis was so terrible that death would be the most likely penalty at a trial. Unwilling to face the public scandal for Seti, she committed suicide rather than face trial. Oh, no. 14 years old. Dude, she's she was a baby. Baby. And Seti was a pharaoh. Yes. I mean, like... Like, what do you do? You can't say you no. You can't say no to him. Yeah, or else oh, you die, that right? sucks. Yeah. Oh, So this was all witnessed by her husband as he sees her get up out of bed to complete these automatic writings while in a trance. Whoa. At one (laughs) point, (laughs) he ran out of the house in fear because he claimed to see a pharaoh sitting at the foot of Edie's bed. Dude. Yeah. Dude. What would you do? I don't know. I would freak out too. I'm like, (laughs) what? My my husband is going crazy? Yeah, that's insane. He's like getting up in the middle of the night and writing in yeah and a totally different yeah yeah language that oh no oh no oh no and see pharaoh sitting there oh my gosh what the heck man Uh, my brain is the whole time (laughs) we're doing this my brain is going walk like an egyptian (laughs) 
<laughs> I love that. It's very Homer Simpson. <laughs> so Dorothy and Abdel have a child and BT dub when Edie became a mother, she followed Egyptian custom of not referring to the mother's first name and became known as Om Seti or mother of Seti because she named the child Seti mm-hmm. after the the guy. The Pharaoh yes. that deflowered her, exactly. ate her goose, ate her, <laughs> ate her goose, and then cooked it. You know, <laughs> holy babe. Now, in 1956, Om Seti, she becomes the first woman to obtain a job in the antiquities department at Abydos, a place where she knew she was meant to be because that was where Seti One was from. But here, according to her memory, she told archaeologists where to find the exact location of the temple garden. And after careful excavation by archaeologists, they found it. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, she knew. Then she led archaeologists to a hidden tunnel on the north end of the temple. She also told them about a library vault of religious and historical records under the temple of Seti One. But this excavation has not happened yet. Yeah. And she also claimed that the Sphinx was much, much older than what experts believe. So she knows, man. So Om Seti lived her remaining years in Abydos and spent them mostly at the Temple of Abydos. She passed away on April 21st, 1981. Look at her. Wow, that is so awesome. I love that story. That's crazy. I can't imagine being her husband. I'm so right? glad that she was able to like get back to her people. Yes. Oh, and- she divorced, by the way. They got divorced. <laughs> Oh, he divorced her? Well, she, he had to go to Iraq to live, and she's like, no, I'm not leaving Egypt. So, Oh. Yeah, so he's like, bye. And she's like, bye, I'm going to stay here because this is my home. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's intense, yeah. man. She knew. Like, this is this was her apparent life. That's crazy how it took over. And I'm wondering if that accident just kind of, that was why. Remember, again, like, things happen, you know. Yeah. So that accident probably just like bumped a big thing and like that that whole past life just came through more than so than her actual personality. Yeah. That's interesting. So uh, yeah. Oh, that <laughs> <laughs> like so many thoughts are racing through my brain right now. It's cool, huh? Oh. So reincarnation, man. Like yeah. how it's it's crazy with these I'm sure people will argue constantly over this, but man, it's hard to for me when reading about this and researching like I fully How believe you that, that like you don't this is it's real mm-hmm. it's real and just because most of us don't remember mm-hmm. you know I think it's oh it's which so fascinating makes me I love this topic so much <laughs> <laughs> which I want to it talk about in spin. movie time because there's some things that we I <laughs> yeah because I ha- I think we have very different opinions about this movie <laughs> but before we get there let yes. me do my little plug get your little okay. plug in if you guys remember back in episode, what was it? 20, 26. 26. Episode 26. I issued a challenge that nobody has answered. Flower do? No. Who is Barbro Carlin? Oh. Barbro Carlin. I didn't get that one. She is reincarnated. Um, so look up Barbara Carlin. If anybody can tell me who she is, dang it, that would be a really fun one to do. Maybe okay. we'll do her, but I want somebody to tell me. You can email us at the ominous stitch at gmail.com. And uh, you can let us know who that is. Or if you guys have any other stories or any other show ideas, it's a whole new year. What do you guys want from us this year? We want to connect with you. So email us at theoministitch at gmail.com. You can also go over to podbean.com where we host our little podcast and look us up, The Ominous Ditch Podcast. You can see show notes from this show or any previous show. There's also a little button you can click on that says become a patron. We love our patrons. We send them stuff. We give them shout outs and we love to be able to connect with them. And they also help us be able to continue to do this for you guys. We are going on year three. Holy cow. I know. Isn't that crazy? In June. That's, that's insane. when we started, right? Um, uh, yeah. I think June. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you guys, we're still doing this and we want to keep doing this for you. So uh, become a patron and help us out. Help us continue to do this for you guys. Yes, please. And if you want to just reach out to us and say hello, you can go on any social media and uh, find us there and give Nicole and I a shout out because we love connecting Yay. with you guys. All right. Oh, wait, wait, real oh, quick. Oh, oh. How do you spell that last name again? So they Bar- know. Barbara Carlin. So 
It's not Barbara. It's Barbro. B A R B R O. Okay. Carlin. K A R L E N. Okay. She's Swedish. Swedish. Yes. Okay. We'll have to look that up. Barbro Carlin. Or she may be in our next reincarnation episode. Yeah. 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 yeah she should. It's it's a good one, man. Okay. It's a good one. Okay. So. Yep. Movie time. It's movie time. <laughs> This episode's movie review, Audrey Rose, released in 1977, 5.8 stars on IMDb, and the synopsis. A stranger attempts to convince a happily married couple that their daughter is actually his daughter reincarnated. This is fascinating because I I looked up reincarnation movies before and I never came across this one. Yeah. But it's crazy because who does it have in it? Uh, it has um, Anthony Hopkins, which is Sir crazy. Anthony Hopkins, right? Yes, a young Sir Anthony, Hopkins. a very young Sir Anthony Hopkins. Just kind of see, nice to see, and mm-hmm. then a lot of other people we don't know. But um, <laughs> man, I'm sure they were famous back in the day. I'm sure they were. <laughs> um, the ho- the apartment they lived in was insane. Oh my gosh, can you even imagine? Like that's an the apartment. Artwork? Yeah, that was like the painted ceilings. Yeah, and then the I'm like, how much money do they and- have? Right? It's crazy. In New York City? In New York, yeah. Oh, man. But yeah, so the synopsis is exactly what what it is. So um, yeah, Anthony Hopkins um, has been stalking the little Ivy. Yes, stalking. 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 So I have so many (laughs) issues with this movie. I was going to let Nicole kind of do her thing. But no, you guys... I have so many issues. She with this doesn't movie. like this movie. I don't like it. I'm okay. so mad at Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> I'm so mad at him. Because, okay, here's my thing. Yes, okay, the girl was having nightmares. Yes. Night terrors. Yes. And she didn't know why. She didn't understand. Okay, got that. That's fine. But Anthony Hopkins killed her. He totally killed her. Yes, he killed her. Hey, spoiler alert. Angel thinks she killed. he killed her. Yeah, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen, it's a really <laughs> old movie. Obviously, Anthony Hopkins is you very You know, I thought it, there was going to be a twist to the movie when he kept coming around. I, I swear that either one, he was in the other car that caused the car accident. Yeah. But then we found out that's not right. Yeah. Two, I thought that Ivy's dad was going to be the one that had caused the car accident. And that's why the soul went into Ivy. And I was like, yeah. oh, that would have made way more sense Oops, as I hit my microphone. <laughs> but um, it would have made more sense. But no, it was this random lady because she was in court at the end. Like they have this big trial because, you know, he's like, he's ridiculous. He's stalking and he he's- kidnaps her. Yeah. And <laughs> BS on the police not being able to do anything. You I can know, file right? a restraining order. Like, oh, this man is stalking yeah, my family. Yeah, we see him everywhere. Well, we told we our lawyer a min- min- like tens of times, and the lawyer's like, I just want more evidence. Like, yeah. what? I can't do anything because yeah. he hasn't physically touched anybody. Right. I'm like, no, that doesn't no, matter. He is stalking, stalking. her. He's like, always that's around. That's why restraining the family. orders exist. So right. you can say, back the F off. Yeah. Stay away. Do something better about your situation than this. So, and I'm so mad. Of course, this is, you know, the time period when this movie came out. Mm-hmm. But like, the mom is like so wimpy and mm-hmm. she can't protect. I'm like, BS. Yeah. Come on. No, you're her mom. It's so, no, 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 no. That's not that's not how moms are. Moms are mama bears. They can protect their children yes. and they can help them. But obviously her the dad was the, you know, no, it's patriarch just, it's of the family. Fine, <laughs> but no, that's just BS. I don't I hate movies when they paint women to be and this was all movies until Back very then. recently. Yeah. But, you know, they paint women as these people that like can't do anything they're incredibly helpless all the time and it just drives me insane (laughs) I can't I can't get behind the movie for that I can't get behind the movie because I it's Anthony Hopkins fault yeah she never Ivy would never have thought that she was somebody else like it didn't come from her she wasn't having these experiences of being reincarnated she didn't know what her previous name was she didn't have any recollection of her previous life she was having night terrors Mm -hmm. um, but she didn't understand what that was or what that was about right the the only information he's going off of were from quote-unquote psychics yeah psychics told him that this was his daughter reincarnated but then he calms her down 
during the night terror, which was well, interesting. anybody could come. They were true. calming her down before he showed up That's and true. before he started yelling, Audrey Rose. <laughs> constantly and like, it's steady it's steady it's steady it's, it's steady. steady that's all i, I, I that's exactly that what the dad was doing before like right. he was like it's daddy it's daddy and she'd wake up and be like daddy oh yeah you know just bs the whole thing was so <laughs> unnecessary and made me but mad the, the the burning of the hands on the cold window i believe i believe the mom versus the dad on that it wasn't the radiator no okay yeah there were like stigmata things that were happening yeah. yes yeah, that so, was just to further the yeah. movie that like, oh, she is to make you think, oh, she is reincarnated right. as Audrey Rose and blah, 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 blah. But freaking Anthony Hopkins is so pushy. He pushes his way into the family. Mm -hmm. The cops are like, we can't do anything, which they can. Right. It gets to the point where he's like in the apartment and he's kidnapped the daughter. He won't <laughs> let the parents in, which, of course, they finally are like, OK, we can arrest you now because you're kidnapping the daughter. And then like the parents get on. The mom is ridiculous. Like, oh, he's the only one that can help my daughter. No, you can help your daughter. She is your daughter. Like, yep. yes, she may have been somebody <laughs> else in a previous life. But she's not that person and she doesn't remember that person at all. She's trying to connect to that person because everyone keeps telling her that that's who she was. But like, no, it is not a typical story of reincarnation. I don't like this movie because well, she doesn't know. Like if it comes from her. Yeah. Because I was trying to figure out what well, my reaction saying, was. He's saying the soul, his soul, sh her soul, Audrey Rose's soul yeah. should not have moved on. Um, because it was unfinished and that's why you know she's still in that phase so I'm guessing and he studied in India for so long about it my my biggest complaint you write about a lot of it but if you're if you get put in a psychic trance like that like you wouldn't <laughs> I, I, that was the hardest part about it at the end like it was ridiculous yeah she couldn't get taken out of it which I'm like what and then she was dying <laughs> Yeah. She died. <laughs> she died because she was in the psychic trance. And I'm like, no. 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 And then everyone was fine with it. She's at yeah, peace yeah. now. <laughs> like, no, she's not at peace. Oh my Your God. dumbass kept pushing and pushing and pushing yep. until like you killed her because you kept pushing because right. you missed your daughter. But the, the dad was the one who convinced them to do the psychic thing, not him. Well, that yeah. was from the prosecution, not the defense. Yeah. So the yes, the dad did want to do yeah. it because he was he didn't trying believe. to get the he didn't yeah. believe and yeah. he was trying to get the guy to back off and like whatever. It's still Anthony Hopkins' fault. And then why was he the one that was allowed to like be around her and hold her hand in the last breath? That's so ridiculous. Everything about this is so upsetting to me. <laughs> You're funny. I love it. That made me mad. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many stitches would you give this one, Nicole? Um, you know, I didn't hate it as much as you did. It may, it was a good movie, but it made me mad. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. But that's good. I got a reaction out of you. Isn't yeah, that what movies I got are a for? Sure. <laughs> We're getting oh massages by Rosie. <laughs> Rosie is like pushing on us. Uh, love She's so happy to have Nicole back right now. Yay. Like I can't tell I you. Rosie. She would be all on Nicole's lap if we would let her. <laughs> Okay, how many stitches? Um, I I give it like a four and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would give it probably a three because it wasn't like a terrible. And like, it was like I watched it. Yeah. It was you know. But. And it's a mystery movie, not a horror movie. Again, like we usually do more horror, but um, I thought because it it fit into our theme, so that worked out right. Mm -hmm. The acting was much better in this movie than last week's movie. <laughs> Correct. <so. laughs> not my negative five thousand or whatever I gave it. Yeah. <laughs> Ten thousand. Oh, that was it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, like I said, like you said, the, some of the sets were really pretty, like the apartment, man, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, for 1970s, they did a pretty good job with the, the, um, what's it called? The dialogue and, and then, and Anthony Hopkins, even yeah. though you hate his, that's, he does that. He's good at that. Like, yeah. Remember he's good Science at of the Lambs. He's, just, he's, just, he's got this intensity behind him yeah. that either he's a good guy and you enjoy his intensity right. or he's. He just pushes yes. whatever the line is. And yep. he's really good at that. He's very good at that. So I really enjoyed that about him. In life, in reality, he's a very <laughs> sweet man. I'm sure he is. He's a very sweet man. Yeah. And he gave me my cat, my Aww. first cat. And he was a very, very See, sweet man. He's a good guy. But like, dude. Acting wise, uh, man, he's good. Anthony, you are wrong. <laughs> 
<laughs> she is not your daughter. <laughs> the dad actually made me mad more than anybody in that whole movie. I don't know why. I just, I was really mad at him for everything. He just, the way he well, treated he his wife. Yeah. Like, baby. And, and, and like trying to make her listen to him. But I'm, I'm kind of glad she didn't stick up completely, but she still was like, she testified on her own and yeah yeah she did kind of speak her mind a yeah. little bit but like yeah but but it, was was still, jerk, it was still it was still very very chauvinistic yes. and very um because that was the time that was the, the time yeah. i know <laughs> uh. <sighs> And I could stitch to it because you didn't need to watch it all. No, you didn't. Dialogue was yeah, there for you. You didn't. So. I did have to rewind and be like, did she really just die? <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened? So I didn't it have did. To, yeah. Yep. Ugh, I was go. so mad at that. I'm Sorry. Like, what? But I don't know. Okay. Anyway. But, you know, we watch watched it. it. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> it's free on Amazon and free on Tubi. Tubi. Yep. So, yay. Always, always, always. I love reincarnation episodes. <laughs> This was so fun. It's fun. I mean, it's it's crazy to think of a different way of, of life after death. And the movie that did help me in the fact that like like a lot of people believe that we just die and that's it. But I just don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. Reincarnation's awesome. Reincarnation is awesome. I always love when we do this topic. Yep. Happy New Year, Happy Stitchers. New Year. We're so excited for this next year. Yes. And until next time, from very, very tired Disneyland voices, <laughs> we'll see you, Stitchers. See you, Stitchers. Oh.